Ravanatham, it's such a pleasure. Sorry it took so long. Everybody, I'm, so sorry. I'm sorry. I, I want to tell you something, Rabbi Yaakov. Um, yeah. Everything is Letova, but it's my first time on Instagram. I'm not so famous. I'm much more famous with the Zoom <laughs> technique. So I'm really, really sorry for those uh, 18 people who are waiting. There's a, there's a great exercise, Rabbi Nachman. They, <laughs> somebody, somebody, a friend of mine who runs a special ed department, and he does, there are cer certain variations of this, but if you don't understand any English words, please tell me. So um, he, he tells the, the teachers that in a computer class, or they also, to, to take the mouse with their other hand. If they, if they use the right hand, they should try it in the left hand just to feel what it's like, you know, not to be able to, uh, not to be able to function. Even a little thing like just changing hands makes you almost not be able to function. So, so One, I, maybe it's good yes. for the, you and I who tell parents to be patient with their children. <laughs> now we ask the parents to be patient with us. So, <laughs> So, you know, I, I, you know, I maybe if you remember when you visit my school, sure. I show you that uh, I teach the kids life skills, soft yeah, sure. skills. That's right. So That's one right. of my first uh, activities, I, I cover the, their eyes and just walking together and to feel the same. That's the way I raise empathy. That's beautiful. People, yeah, it's the same idea. <laughs> is that so Rabbi Nachum is just an, he wears so many hats and he's, yeah, did you sleep at all today Rabbi Nachum? <laughs> I hope we'll have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, it's five sleep. in the morning for him. I, I spoke to Rabbi Nachum, right. we, we communicated before, right, right, as he was on his way to the airport to set up the session. So uh, welcome to, to America Rabbi Nachum. Um, I hope your trip is successful and um, I will certainly, if anyone if anyone wants to find out more about uh, Rabbi Nachman's work and how they can help him out, um, you can email me, you can, you can message me here. I'll be glad to get you in touch with him. So tell me, tell me Rabbi Nachman, uh, let, let's just start from the end, I guess, uh, and, and start with this remarkable article that you wrote. Um, what's it been like uh, in terms of uh, the feedback and uh, what have you been hearing um, from children from parents, from educators, you know, there are, there are different constituencies here. There are different uh, par interested parties here. And um, I'm just curious what, what your feedback, what your feedback has been. I, I, just by the numbers of follow, you know, of, of likes and, and forwards and shares, it was just, I don't recall seeing that many on, on an article written, you know, set by a public official or something. So tell me, please, what's it been like? Um, you know, it comes by accident. I, I just recently had so many stories. All oh, the parents, uh, they reject their kids. And uh, I recently was famous with the story that it was almost suicide. It was so, so terrible stories. And, one, and I, I said for my daughter, okay, let's do something. Maybe we can inspire other people. So you that said, story, the daughter you had, the daughter that you wrote the article about, they had a picture with. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I said, let's do something to, to help people. We have we have good relationship. Let's do something for others to to uh, to 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 give a good feeling that, that that it's okay, it's okay that we have different uh, paths in life. And she said, if if it's useful, I'm I'm there. So that's why. And I didn't, I couldn't imagine that this would be so viral. And you know how, you know why I, I know it's viral? Because uh, I published in the, uh, the, the Times of Israel and some Christian people write me that they're very, very sorry about their kids, they, they're out of the dark. <laughs> so so that is under, I un really understood how much it spread. But I, I believe that I think everyone who has a WhatsApp in the Haredi community read this article. I, I believe And that. this is a huge, a huge, um, a huge privilege for me uh, to do something because so many stories happened afterward and I got phones from Belgium and from America and some private emails. I, now I can open an office and just serve in the community for the next 10 years. It's unbelievable how much 
uh, applications I get in the last uh, two weeks. Yeah, people, people and, and reached, reached out. Sorry, out there, and also, out I want to talk about my English. It's not my mother language. And yeah, I didn't understand. speak Hebrew until the age of 20. So I just yeah. apologize. But yeah, I, I, I asked Rabbi Nathan if, we, if, I, if it's okay if he does the interview in English. And, and he very graciously said yes. I don't know if, if you asked me to do an Avrit uh, to do <laughs> in Hebrew. I don't know if I'd be so bold. So Kalakavo to you for, for, for doing that too. Um, Thank you. I'm curious, just for, for you want to summarize the article or should I tell our listeners basically what you wrote? For you, those it read it? Than, you would do it better than me. Okay, so uh, Rabbi Nachum basically wrote, um, there were a few parts to the article. First was like the human side, walking through the mall and having his daughter was wearing jeans and, and uh, some people saw a Haredi guy walking with, uh, with a young lady with jeans and they were like, what's the story, yeah. right? And, and he says, this is my daughter, I love her. And I, that was the personal side of it. And then um, Rabbi Nachum really methodically, carefully made the case of why it's important to, to embrace your children and, and to, to be welcoming, to, to um, be loving and, and not to have that obviously very important to us. The religion, you know, is such a big part of our lives. And, it's natural for parents to feel a sense of rejection that the child is is rejecting what they've learned at home and rejecting the teachings. And Rabbi Bambach Rabbi Nachum explained that it's not the case. They're just doing they're just doing things differently. It doesn't mean that they don't respect you. It doesn't mean they don't love you. It just means that they are are you know doing it doing something else. And he wrote a few specific. There were about six or seven points there. Um, and, and one of them, which was very, very meaningful, was talking about our great leaders over time, both from the, from the Chumash, from the Bible, you know, from the original, um, from our patriarchs. You know, the Torah didn't, as Rabbi Menachem said, if I'm, if I'm not, Rabbi Menachem, if I'm, if I'm not doing the right thing, just wave, please. <laughs> if I'm not, if I'm not uh, conveying the article as well as you wrote it. Um, please tell me, but Rabbi Nachum, uh, how am I doing so far? We good? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so Rabbi Nachum wrote about about how the Torah didn't uh, um, didn't cover up, didn't didn't uh, um, you know not write about the fact that that Avraham Avinu had a Yishmael, and that and that Yaakov Avinu had struggles with them. I'm sorry, Yitzchak had Esav, and 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 throughout other uh, throughout um, even recent history and and throughout our history. People have, you know, have had children pick different paths in life. And I, I love the fact that you wrote about the internet. I love that was like a, an as, a sideline, but it was very interesting. You know, Rabbi Bambach was saying, you know, typically uh, uh, many people um, tend to blame everything or, or put the ills of society all, all on technology. And Rabbi Nachum said, all of these things that happened were before technology, all the people that you were listing, um, that that you know that that had issues was before technology, um, so so that that was really the article. It was about a personal as a as a father. It was about his daughter. I mean, you just look at that picture. I wish I could flash it. I'm not that good at I'm not that good at Instagram either yet. I could see the picture of uh, as a father of three daughters. I absolutely could identify. You see, his daughter is just beaming. I know it was at a family wedding, I believe. Um, the picture, um, but you see the bar two of them. Sorry, it was a bar mitzvah. It was a bar mitzvah. Oh, it was a bar mitzvah. You see the <laughs> two of them clearly comfortable in each other's company and with a, an, an incredible amount of love. Um, so I, I, I'd be curious. You know, I find sometimes that you know you speak for a half hour, you write a long article, and people pick up one one piece of it. You know, and I'm, I'm always curious when someone says nice article or I didn't like the article you wrote, a nice speech, or I, dis I said, what is it that you like or what is it that you didn't like? Sometimes people feel I'm putting them on the spot. I try not to. But I would be curious from that article, what was the most common or the two most common pieces that people took from that? I think everybody is identified with something different, but uh, the fact that people, 
you know, I, I get very a lot of empathy in the secular community. Right. There is, there is very a huge a community in Israel uh, that uh, already who dropped out of the derech. So they have also a group in the Facebook and they ask me a favor to, to take this article and to put it inside because they, I think the majority of them reject it. Right. So they just, and, uh, and, 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 but, you know, the Haredim, uh, I'm not sure they want to admit, they, they, they watched the article, they saw the article, but, so that's why they cannot protest or say, say something, but I think the, I, I got a lot, a lot, a lot of very, very positive comments inside the Haredi community. And one of the stories is really touched me very much. Before I came to the beginning of the week, it was Sunday. A mother came to me with his son. He has a beautiful son, Isabel Zechosit. And she said that she was rejected from her parents. And she was become revealed to the article. And she said she wants that my son should be educated in a, in a man like you. That's what she said. Wow. So she so, wanted to put a child in your school. Yeah. Oh, wow. She said that that's, that's, that's the right way. So that's the best. That's the yeah, best. It's, very it's very touching. That's beautiful. My aunt, I think my aunt used to say, Rabbi Nachum, my aunt, my aunt used to say, she used to say, don't compliment my food. Ask for a second portion. Ask for doubles. <laughs> so, so, you know, when somebody, when somebody wants to put that nice article, anybody could say, when somebody says, I want to put my child, I want my child to be educated by you, that's, that's as good as it gets. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I think also people are very lost. They don't have a, to, to, to take advice from someone. They blame themselves. Uh, I got a phone call from very, very a sad story from Belgium family. They immigrate to, to Belgium, they're Israelis, and they also suffering or dealing with such issues. And I asked them, you have any help, any support? Before you support your child, you need your own support. So you need somebody to help you to, to strengthen you. Your resilience is so important. So, and she asked me, Baruch Hashem, I made the contact with very good psychology in Israel, and now she started treatment, she with her husband, and that's, that's, that's great, you know, if you can fix the world a little bit more, it's, it's great privilege. Yes, it, it's a real schos you had, it's a, it's a real schos of merit that you had to be able to, to touch so many lives, and, you know, I, 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 I will, I often say that when people have a child that, that's challenging or picks a different path in life, um, it's, like, it's like running a business that loses money. You know, like you run a business, you're making money, everybody's fine, everybody's happy, everybody's smiling. Yeah. And then things turn south and everybody's tense all of a sudden and then everybody's, you know, um, and, and um, you know, one one of the questions I got a number of questions I posted a few I don't know if you saw that I, I'm sure you were busy today and trying to I, I, yeah I didn't have uh... trying to take a nap so one person wrote a few questions and one of them was um, that until now you know till a hundred years ago or fifty years ago even ten you know twenty thirty years ago people would would excommunicate the children who were religious fearing that it would have a negative impact on the rest of their family, that it would, it would, it would, it would hurt the religious uh, nature of their, their home. Everybody's keeping Shabbat. You have uh, a, a son or a daughter who's uh, texting in the room or coming to the table, you know, uh, um, either not, you know, keeping Shabbat at all or everybody, the kids all know that they're not keeping Shabbat. What does that look like for the rest of the family? And people would, would tend to respond by just sending them out. And this fellow asked, are, are we saying, you and I, you know, those of us who believe that we should love them unconditionally, are we saying that that was a mistake, that they did things differently? Um, and, and how do we understand people doing this? Um, and, and how do we understand the difference and why, what do we attribute it to? I would love to hear your thoughts, please. I would say two things. 
Uh, I think uh, pe- parents that their kids is, uh, is uh, drop, dropped out, it's a feeling of out of control. You don't have any control of your child. Right. I think it's a psychology way, the only way to take again out, out to control again is just to make an action that you feel you continue controlling the system. I so that's why I'm like sending them out. Yeah. Oh, you're sending them out. You're reasserting <laughs> control, in other words. That, that it's like, fascinating. It's fighting. Yeah, it's right. And I think also the idea of sitting Shiva is also, oh, I take control. Now I'm going to do what I think is the right way. Uh, it's also, you know, it's very it's a violent, uh, it's a mental violent way out to, to, to damage our kids. But it's about control. I think it's about control. Because, and also we know the Haredi community is very, very about uh, Maya Gidu, what people are going to say, and the pressure inside the community. Right. And once you have very, very a radical community, it's much uh, radical. So, uh, and people, you know, that's, that's the way, you know, I educate my kids to say, what do you feel? What do you right. think? What do you think? Don't be, uh, if so, I, I used to say that if someone is speaking behind you, that means you, you are ahead in one step. Um, if someone you, is speaking badly about you, you mean? It is behind you, you know? Behind you, somebody's saying but, behind you. But that's you are ahead in, in one You're step. You're ahead of them, right? So I mean, somebody's, if somebody's it, standing behind you and whispering or chirping about what you're doing, you're ahead of them already. Yeah. So I, we know this is one of our uh, uh, principles in the Haredi community to control. Also, you know, the feeling that you, about Shiduchim, for, for example, I want to right. say something about Shiduchim. People uh, feel that if they, people will, will know the rea- one of the child has become, is dropping, dropped out from the community, so it could uh, damage their, the, the, the suggestion of making good Shiduchim. Shiduchim, are, shiduchim for those who don't know, Shiduchim are, are uh, you know, uh, uh, potentially a marriage. Uh, uh, some, some of them were married, dating, basically. So. Yeah, <clears throat> but all we're thinking about <clears throat> the people are confused between culture and Haredi and between love, uh, faith in God. I think it's two different ways. Haredi is, the, is a, just idea how to protect your religious. But this is by themselves is not, uh, you don't need to, to sacrifice about Haredin. And we need to, uh, which, mes- which message we deliver for our kids when we are not, we are worried what people are gonna say. And I think this is all also reason why the kids are not, uh, they, they sometimes feeling it's, it's not true. It's a little lie. So I, I'm, I'm looking, you know, I, I, I had many times that people ask me, Ah, you know, my kid is dropping out and I'm worried about his ad, his capillage and his record. Right. Right. Much more than, I wrote it also in the article, much more than in his wearing to feeling because... I, I saw is, you wrote that in, in the article. Yeah, no right. one knows, but... Just, 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 so, just I, let, let me just say, in case of Ramanacham, you know, for those who didn't read the article, uh, Rabbi Bambach pointed out a, an incredibly important, uh, Nikuda, an incredibly important point, and that was that um, in, in, in America, we call it Rabbanachim, form or substance. Form, substance is tochen, you know, what's real. And form is the, how you package things. So um, Rabbanachim wrote in the piece that how disturbing it was for him to, again, Rabbanachim, if I'm not, um, if I'm not uh, saying, yeah, correct. Please, please correct yeah, me. Correct. Um, Rav Nachum was saying how, how he didn't write the word disturbing there, but it was clear from his, from his, uh, uh, the inflection of the words that he was using was that, um, that he asked people if they're more, somebody expressed that they're more concerned about the trappings, the chitzonius, the, the outer package of what Rabbi Bambach and I look like when we walk in the street you know, wearing our clothing and, and, and uh, you know, with a beard and, and peyot, you know, all of that, um, rather than the core observance, which is, let's say, putting on tefillin, phylacteries, 
which which uh, Jewish adult men are supposed to wear every day. So, in other words, Rabbi Nachman was saying if, uh, that that parents should focus, um, l care less about what your neighbors are going to say, and care more about the reality of the if the children are embracing religion or not. And and you know, I'll tell you, Rabbi Nachman, it's great you and I. We finish each other's sentences, you know. <laughs> it's it's a pleasure. We're we're you know, the first from the first time we met. I'll tell you something that I tell parents when they tell me about. We could share ideas. You just gave me one, so I'll give you one. Um, I tell parents when they say their child is dressing in this way. This, I said, if you lived on a farm, if you lived on a farm, and you had no neighbors what would you do? Would you do the same thing? Um, would you, which is the same way, basically the same concept that you say, it's just another way of getting them to think about it. And the truth is that we don't live in farms, right? Which is, which is the challenge. Um, so what was people's response to that part? You know, when you say about the tefillin, but nobody sees the tefillin, right? But people see, see the other stuff. And, and that's normal, you know, uh, folks, there's a, there's an, there's an old uh, Yiddish expression that um, we pick up a little of an esteric, uh, the, 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 the four species that we hold on, uh, uh, fruits that we, you know, uh, uh, we have a palm, a little of an esteric. Um, we, we make a blessing on that and we shake it in shul, in public. And uh, uh, when we, before we go to sleep, we say Shema in our own bedroom to ourselves. So... Mm -hmm. So what the Yiddish expression goes, that if we shook the lulav in our bedroom and we, we said sh Kriya Shema, the Shema at night in this shul, imagine how differently it would look, <laughs> right? right? Uh, a good, you'll, yeah, that's a good line, right? So not my, <laughs> it's not my line, but, but, that, <laughs> but the reality is that we do, you know, and, and it is. I, I'd like to share a thought. I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this. And I, I think... That's that would be a response to the the fellow who wrote a, asking the question about did the previous generations uh, do it differently? So there's a there's a wonderful uh, a Syrian rabbi named Rabbi David Ozeri. He's a he's a very distinguished rabbi in the Syrian community in Brooklyn and Deal. And he he uh, we were presenting together at an Agoda convention in in America in, in like 1998, I think it was on Shabbat and Friday night. So we weren't being recorded, so we could say whatever we wanted, you know? So he said that, he said, look, Syri we in the Syrian community, of course we have problems like everybody else. As he said, he said, well, I'm not gonna tell you we don't have problems, of course we do. He says, one thing we don't have is we don't do labels. We don't have this type of, this brand and this, this. he said, we have a Beth Knesset, there's a synagogue, and everybody's welcome. The people who are Sabbath, Shabbat observant, the people who aren't, the rabbis, the, the lay people, the learned people and unlearned people. So the Svaradi community, since ever, the much more tolerance. The problem is with Ashkenazi. Well, thank you. So, so we, what are you attributed to, Rabbi Nachum? Folks, we never discussed this, just so you know. <laughs> what, what are you attributed to? No, I mean, I mean, I mean, the Ashkenazi community is much more, but the Sephardi is much more open-minded, much can more I, tolerant. Can I, can I offer you my thought why, why that's the case? Yeah. And while he was talking, I did not think of it beforehand. While Rabbi Ozeri was speaking, he turned to me and he said, Ashkenazi, you have to learn to do what we do. He says, we, we, we learn from you. We learn things from each other. But so I told him, like, just, it just hit me in the, on just a, I said, you didn't have the Haskalah. And I, I really believe that a lot of these reactions that we have about the Kaddish sitting, and that would be my response to that fellow. It, it was from the trauma, for, for the Haskalah folks, um, comes from the Shorosh of the word is, you know, he's better at that, right? It comes from the Shorosh of Sechel, Haskalah. Sechel means wisdom. So, in Europe, there was in the 17, late 1700s, the 1800s, there was a period called the Haskalah, the Enlightenment yeah. period. And people, it, it was like, it, it was a whole new world opening up. And 
Um, there were lots of advances in science and, and everything else. And, and the reform movement, the conservative movement, um, all started there until 1700. There were no, there was no such thing as reform, conservative, yeah. Orthodox, Haredi, this, that. You were Jewish, you know? Yeah. And, and like, and, and you know, whether you went to synagogue or not, that was your synagogue. They say, right, that, that in Israel, right, especially in Israel, there's a lot of Sephardi community. They, 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 they the Orthodox shul that they don't go to, <laughs> that's my shul, you know, that, right? So, so, so the people, that's the way it was, folks. I, I, look, read up on it. I really encourage parents to read up on this. The history, everything is, is there's a historical context here. So what, what happened was, all of a sudden, the Enlightenment period came and the Ashkenazim, the, the, not the, the Sephardim that came from, from you know, the, the lands closer to the Middle East and, and the like, um, and the, the, the Ashkenazim, the people from, from Poland and Russia and, and, and Lithuania, got clobbered. The whole, look, look at the percentages. Now Orthodoxy has, had a re, you know, has become much more, much more uh, larger and more powerful over the last 30, 40 years. When I was a kid, I grew up in Bell Harbor, so there was the Orthodox Shul had 75 families. The conservative and, and reform temples had 1,500 families each. So, so I think they were so rattled that they sort of had this reaction of, we have to hold on. So yeah. I, I think there's also a historical context, which I feel we don't have to feel this way today. That's, that's, that's my, my big point. Uh, someone just asked about this. Hasidus was also a reaction to a lot of that. Absolutely, yeah. I also, we know that the Sephardic community had in the previous year very uh, uh, great poske alcha, like Rabbi Yosef Mashash, right. that we have a different, uh, they knew how to live even we are between uh, non-Jews non or very interesting uh, issues they, they, yeah, they, they deal with. Yeah. Um, so, what, what, what is, bottom line, what would be your advice to a, to a parent who says, um, it was really beautiful, I saw you there with your daughter, but I, I would just find it so difficult to do, or what do I tell the other children? That's probably the most common question. What do I tell the other children? If, I, if, if I'm embracing our non-religious child, exactly the same as the other children. So isn't that sending a message that, you know, 50-50, you just picked, it's fine with us. Do, you know, either way is fine with us. What, 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 what would be your response to that? I think, uh, I think it's very, very important for parents to know how to speak with their kids, open conversations, and usually the kids understand more than us. I mean, they, f even you don't say something, maybe they can interpret it in, in a different way, but kids understand everything. And y y the regular kids, they don't, you know, we know to identify those, pe those kids who are in a risk. We, we know people for the ADD, people who are be abused, or all those kinds of things. This is why uh, they do so many young kids are going out of the derech. And there is many other things, yeah? I mean, this is not the only, but we know there is a risk. But regular kids, usually they want to follow the rules. They want to adopt the norms from the community. And I think parents who speak openly that we have another child that each was different. We love him because they're part of our family. And you love him because they're part of our family. And everybody needs to love. This is the most important thing. And people and kids, when they feel it's a real respect inside the home, I think it's not, it's not, it's not going to influence them. Absolutely not. Not. It's not going to influence them because it's also about respect. The other way, I think uh, parents who reject their kids, it's very a bad, a bad message for the other kids. I think it damaged them much more. They will never forget uh, our parents. And you know what? Let's say one of the kids wants to go out of the derech. Let's say. And he will not do it just because... Uh, he, he don't want to He's make afraid it. of what the parents will respond. Afraid, we better say. And sometimes to, to stay inside, it's I mean, it's a terrible thing. 
because you feel you're, uh, you feel you're not connected and right. you need to present yourself and it's a damage your image, your, your image of God is damaged. Right. And sometimes people need to go out to make their journey, to find, to, to create their, their identity, to define their identity. In, and this is the new world, we need to understand. And, 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 and I think you know uh, Rabbi uh, Arav, uh, Uri Zohar, he's very famous active in Israel. Yeah. He became a Belchuva. Right. Uh, he, was a movie star. he was a movie star in Israel. He was very a movie star. I think everybody knows about him. And he became a Belchuva in the age of 40. And he has six children. All of these six become secular. And he said for his wife, you know, I'm doing the best what I can to educate my kids, to make them a good example, to be a dogmatova. And I think the, what the most important thing what we need to do just to change the way how we, um, uh, we speak to them and we need to raise uh, our respect to them. And you will not believe all of the six come back. All of the six came, became yeah. I, I just wanted to yeah. back up a little bit and, and, and perhaps, um, I, I, Rabbi Bambach made such important points. So I just want to review them a little bit in case, in case uh, um, some of our listeners didn't pick up, you know, the, the nuance from from um, Rabbi Nachum. Um, he's doing a remarkable job in, in his second language. What did you say? You, you didn't speak English till you were twenty. What was that? I didn't speak Hebrew until the day of twenty. You only spoke Hebrew till twenty. Only Yiddish, because oh, you this only is spoke Yiddish. You didn't even speak Hebrew either. Yeah, I immigrated. The third language. <laughs> I used I used to say that I immigrated to Israel at the age of twenty because I'm, <laughs> I'm coming from Be'er Sharim. I'm coming I, from the Torah. I did I did not know that. Um, Rabbi <laughs> Bamak was joking because uh, typically uh, the very Hasidish uh, uh, communities in 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 Israel tend to speak Yiddish rather than Hebrew. So he's I thought he was saying that he didn't speak English till he was 20. He said, I didn't even speak Hebrew till I was 20. So the English is, is, is the third language. So Rabbi Nachum was talking about the certain risk factors and was saying, I think it's a very important message to parents that, um, that we, there are identifiable, even if we don't have formal studies on this, but there are identifiable, all of those who work in the field and even anecdotally parents understanding it yourselves we, we know there are, that there are certain risk factors, let's say, you know, ADD, for example, or children who suffered some sort of trauma or, or, or learning disabilities or other things like that, or, or very stressful home environments. So, so there was actually, I don't know if you know, Rabbi Nachum, um, there was a study funded in the late 90s. Did you ever see that, that report? Uh, Remind me and I'll email it to you about risk factors. Sectors. They had okay. about 30 of us got together and spent a month or two pulling together to make a, a list of risk factors, and which we, we released to the public for parents to see also. So Rabbi Menachem is saying, in other words, that, that, that the, it, as far as the question, please, Rabbi Menachem, if I'm not conveying this properly, let me know. I wasn't taking notes. Um, Rabbi Menachem was saying that, that for parents who are concerned that other children might... Um, might be influenced by the, by a child that's that's abandoning religion. Um, the children who have these risk factors are at risk, as we said. But by and large, the children who aren't typically would not shouldn't be considered as a great risk factor. Then he said that the we think we're sending a message to the children that that. Um, if they abandon religion, our relationship will be harmed by that. And Rabbi Nachum is suggesting, Rabbi Bamak is suggesting, that that's a destructive message because you're telling your children that your love, our love for you is contingent on you embracing religion. So what kind of love is that if I tell, right, if, if, uh, if my wife loved me only if my hair grew back, you know, so yeah. <laughs> what kind of relationship would that be? So if we're telling children, Specifically, we're saying it out. We're saying, look, if you, if you abandon religion, we're not going to have the same relationship anymore. So even the other children in the family who are religious now are saying, oh, that's it? I mean, as long as I do Gemara and, and keep Shabbat, I we're good, and if not... So, so that was another message uh, um, of Rabbi Nachum. 
I just want to tell you, parenthetically, Rabbi Rambach, I, I, I often think of it like, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, and please be honest. I, I think of it that, that, that there are two categories of kids who abandon religion. One is ozvimet adat, that they only abandon religion. And the second is ozvimet achayim, they're abandoning life. That's, I, that I just want to, while we're discussing this, I just wanted to share with parents something that I've observed. Um, that, and, I, and I think what, where it's really relevant, and Rabbi Nachum alluded to this, um, that ozvimet adat, kids who abandon religion, that means that they're, they're in school and they have friends and they're happy and that they're going to parties. Not, we might not like what they're doing, but they like it. In other words, they're happy, they're optimistic, they're looking to the future. They have issues. They, they, maybe they were never religious to begin with. Maybe they were never turned on. Maybe they got turned off. Rabbi Bambach spoke earlier about the fact that children see inconsistencies and how damaging that is, much more than the internet, right? That, that how when they see uh, uh, inconsistencies. So there are so many different reasons. But the Ozumet HaChayim, kids who abandon life, that they're not in school and they're not happy and they're and they're not optimistic and 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 they're harming themselves. You know, they're not doing marijuana or, or drinking lightly. They're doing cocaine and heroin and and God forbid cutting or suicide attempts. So so um, I think there are two separate categories. Parents, if you have a child in the azumet achayim, the abandoning life, that you have to help them. There's nothing. They, they need to become whole. Until they become whole, they don't even bother with religion. It's like, I, want to, and I want to strengthen your message because when it was the 9-11, uh, uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. There's so, some of people are jumping out. Why they jump out? Because they know they're going to die. Why they jump out? Right. Because it was impossible to stay inside. It was impossible. Right. Sometimes kids need to jump out. And we need to be so empathy for them and to understand what's happened. It's, it's a sign. You know, I want to say something. We need, we need to be very honest. There is two reasons of, uh, that people explain why people change uh, their, the culture or the identity or the community. It's a philosophy answer or a psychology. If, you become, if someone become uh, Haredi, yeah, it become Balchuva, what is, is, is Haredi friends going to say? Ah! Now he knows the, the truth. And, and what, what is his secular friend going to say? Ah, is something, something Something's wrong with him. Something. And the opposite is the same. Yeah. If someone become, a, if so, if someone become a, a, a chiloni, yeah, a secular, oh, his friend's going to say, ah, he understands the truth. He's a, a good guy. And, and the Haredim is going to say, ah, Shashem is so right. he's something left with him. So everybody use a different uh, Zimmerman's reason, and and so. Right. We, so go ahead, finish. No, up, finish I mean, up, we're supposed to be honest with ourselves, right? Um, that Rabbi Nachum is saying, in other words, parents, um, it, we expect the families of Bali Chuva, if a, a child grows up secular and becomes religious. Um, we fully expect that the family should accept them 100%, right? Just because they embrace religion, why, why, why should you uh, turn your back on them? Um, and um, we wouldn't say that somebody who abandoned, who became religious, had a miserable life, who was unhappy, and that's why they turned to religion, right? So we should, the, the same way, if our children make different, this, take a different path in life, um, why, if we're embracing, if we're telling children, look, if, if a parent is secular and they're sending the children, they want to send the kids to top universities and they, they enjoy, um, you know, a, a family time that's not uh, religiously oriented on Shabbat, and, and that's what they're doing, they view someone, who, a child who embraces religion and will no longer eat in their house and has different heroes and different value systems, it's very similar to what we feel. It's just, in other words, they, they feel the same way. And we're expecting them to love their children just like that. Rabbi Nachum, am I conveying your message? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So we should understand if we expect them to 
um, to, to uh, parents of, of formerly secular people should accept that children are, you know, with open arms and, and not let that affect their relationship. Why should it be different? I just, I'm going to stop for a moment. Um, JFH20, you know, one of that hen wrote, one of the people just wrote, how do you help a kid that abandoned life? You want to take that Rabbi Nachum or please? Take it. Well, I'm sorry. I should Please answer. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, children who abandon life, um, they're broken. They're broken. They're just broken. And, and whether it's trauma-based, it usually is. You know, we, we've been saying for years that probably 90% or more of the kids who are abandoning life are, are, have had serious trauma. Um, you have to make the, the first and only consideration is to make them whole get them, send them for therapy, make sure that, that you try to build a structure around them where they can, where they can get better and get, get more whole. And until then, if you wanna, I'm not going to now, but if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I'm actually doing units on that in my, week, in the, my under a minute parenting clips next week. Uh, this week, I'm sorry, we're doing Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, if you're interested, you can have a look. But basically, you can't, discuss religion with someone who's, who's broken. If they're not, you, you know, you, you said Rabbi Nachum about 9-11, right? Imagine two days after 9-11, if you go over to a guy who's sitting on the floor with, you know, his house, you know, say, oh, this is such beautiful, come, come to the synagogue. He said, what? You I haven't taken a shower in four days. Like, what are you really talking to me about? So like, it, it's, it's not only a waste of time, a waste of time, it's counterproductive. They, they say, stop talking to me about this. Don't you know I'm hurting? That's the only thing you're worried about is religion? I mean, imagine, imagine, imagine somebody broke, imagine somebody broke their leg. Imagine somebody went skiing or they were playing ball and they broke their leg. And, and rather than look at their leg, you, you know, you tell them, uh, please uh, put, pull your pants down. It's not sniyut. You know, it's not appropriate <laughs> to be there with your pants rolled up. Or you tell them, did you, did you pray today? Imagine, try to get this. Parents, that's my answer to you. How do you help again? So you have a kid on the floor with a broken leg and you walk over and you say, you know, did you, did you pray today? And, uh, or other things like that. They look like you're crazy. What are you talking about? I need a doctor, fix my foot. So when, when you go to talk to religion with children who are abandoning life because, because they were traumatized, they, they, not only can't they listen to you, they get frustrated. Why, this is what you care about? Are you kidding? That's, and by the way, that was, I got rulings from our greatest leaders I asked this, is this a crazy way to think? You know, am I wrong for thinking that you're a thousand percent? You know, I once, I was revealed to very interesting statistics that 80% of people who, who, who experienced that someone broke in their house, the, in, in, in tower three years, they are changing, uh, they, they are uh, moving to another place. I'm sorry, if somebody had a break in, in their house. In their house? So, right. After three years, they were going to move to another place. Within three years, they moved to this. Yeah, went to this. It's something 80% in Israel, we find out in very interesting uh, survey. And after robbery, within three years, yeah. they move because they don't feel comfortable anymore. Because someone in the invasion, so the, 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 feeling, the feeling that something took away their intimacy. So I think, uh, I think there is so many things about young, the young kids that something happens that that's what I want to say. We need to raise uh, so much our empathy because it's, it's not just time because everybody likes to say it's kaludat, just they don't want to, to be related. It's not, it's not about that. It's usually it's lay on different layers and we need so much to embrace them and love. And even not if this, this is the reason, even they choose different, just the respect is so much, it's so important. Uh, I think this is the one of the important thing that we need to deliver for the, uh, you know, uh, for many years ago, when you had the eye walls, physical eye walls, you could, maybe you could protect your kids from outside, but the world completely changed, right. the new generation, and we need to find new practice, how to deal with the new world. We cannot use the old, the old fashioned way and the same, uh, um, the, same, um, the same messages, because we, need, we have to understand it's a different generation. Yeah. And, and you know, maybe I'm blessed that uh, 
uh, I didn't born in in this generation. I mean, I I mean, I <laughs> right. it's so it's just so frustrating. I want to amplify what Rabbi Bambach was just saying is that that one might have believed that it was possible to shelter children. Tell me, please, Rabbi Nachum, if I'm not conveying, please let me know. Rabbi Bambach is saying that someone might have believed, or maybe it really was possible to shelter children 50 years ago, uh, before the advent of technology. So you say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna keep our, you know, we're gonna build this wall around, not a physical wall, but you know, we're gonna build this, this uh, you know, protective shield around our children and keep them away from the outside world. That, and, and therefore the strategies that, that would, keeping that world up, had a whole, uh, um, a whole practice that supported that theory. If we're keeping our children safe from the outside world, we do X, Y, and Z. And if a child leaves, we tell the child to go out with the rest of with the rest of that world. But now that everything is open, um, we need new strategies. Rabbi Nachum, is that exactly? That and I would like to answer the the less the, the the question what she asked. I want to say something about that. Um, uh, we need. To, before we, we force a treatment for someone, we need uh, to make well, sure... That, Rabbi, I'm sorry to interrupt you. you. You're talking about the one who made this comment about refusing help? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so Rabbi Nachum is, is addressing JF with an underscore uh, H122. So the question, if that, I'll just read it quickly. So if the child refuses help, how do you go about yeah. it? Yeah. If you take the broken leg example, would I force yeah. uh, medical, would I force someone to come and get a cast? Go ahead, please. I'm just continuing what you said before, that before we, we can force someone to take a treatment, they need to raise our a trust with, with our kids. When they have a very confident environment, then the next step they can get treatment. But the, we need so much to raise trust. Uh, and it's so important. You know, I heard that uh, in the CEO, they said um, uh, the trust is the new currency. I mean, trust there is a currency. That's very good. Yeah, I mean, the, there is a color, uh, collaboration between trust and um and and money. I mean, if you can see countries when people trust the country, the government, they have much more money. Right. And and, and once they have a, a low a low trust, people are much more. You know, the, the black market is much more high. Right. So. Right. The same thing with our child. We need to raise our trust with them. That and they should trust them. Once, trust them and also not to be judgmental. Right. And they feel, even you don't say something, your body language can deliver judgment to be, uh, you, you, when, when you're judgmental, they feel it. Right. And that's why we need to, to just, uh, to focus about the soul, about the pain and about the choices. Just a human being not to be judgmental, just to elaborate our uh, trust and love. And then the next step, it will be much more easy for them to get the treatment and to be, you know, and to get help. The Hasidim, th thank you, Rabbi Nachum. The Hasidim, there's a story uh, told in the, in the Hasidic world that, that, that one of the Hasidic masters, um, he, he, he said that he learned a great message from two drunks. There were two folks who got, who got you know, heavily, got, got heavy into drinking one night. And one of them hugs the other and he says, I love you, I love you, I love you so much. He hugs the guy. So he says, yeah, if you love me, tell me what's bothering me. That the, uh, one drunk told the other that if you, <laughs> if you love yeah. me, tell me what's what Rabbi Nachum is saying, right? If you, want, yeah. if you want the children to feel that they should feel our love, then that means that we have to know what's bothering him. And it's very often, I, I really encourage parents to ask the children why they're not praying, why they're not davening. If you see a child that, let's say, doesn't want to daven in shul, ask them, is there a reason that you're not davening? Is there something that, that happened? And you never know what they're going to say until you A, ask, and B, they have confidence that they can ask you and you'll listen and you won't judge. That's why the judgmental part is so important. Imagine your child isn't Avon. If I'm not expressing again, please just wave, okay? You're amazing. Um, so, <laughs> no so, well, I'm sorry? 
you're correct. So well, you're when, I come to, when I come to Israel to school and I talk in Hebrew, I hope you'll do the same for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but it, this, is, this is really important because yeah. what Rav Menachem is saying, and I'm putting some words in my but only because, because of the English I'm saying, Rav Menachem is, is suggesting that, that we need, there's really two parts to it. One is that we tell the children that they can talk to us, but if we're going to judge them, they really won't talk to us, right? Uh, um, uh, he didn't use this example. I will, I'm saying, imagine, uh, uh, just imagine dealing with our spouses. Imagine that we lost a job. We did a foolish thing at work and we got fired or, or we got Dr. Week's pay, you know? Would we tell our spouse and come home? We would love to. Wouldn't we love to be able to tell our husband or our wife, you know, I really messed up at work. Sweetheart, I messed up at work and, and, and I'm so embarrassed and I, I don't know what to do. Imagine how comforting it is to be able to tell a spouse. Now, if the spouse is going to look at you, you loser. I told you not to do that. You know, why you, you kind of, so you won't, the, the spouse won't talk. I think about comforting it would be, they would love, I'm telling you, the children would love to talk to us. But the two things that Rabbi Nachim is saying, let them know that you're interested in finding out and don't judge them. They don't need yeah. a speech. They, once you talk to them, once they'll talk to you if you create the environment that, that they're comfortable. Could you address this, Rabbi Nachum? I, I um, uh, Chaya EIS 1. Um, if the system, the school, and the cheder are you, I'm sure, <laughs> Rabbi Nachum, I'm sure this is something that comes across your desk all the time. Um, what if the system that is, are using old strategies um, I'm concerned about how it's affecting my children. What would be your response? I'm not going to say mine yet. Go ahead. Please, please. I, I believe that we can influence our kids much more than the school. And I think uh, we, the, the, the wisdom of our child is so high that we can under, give him, we can explain them sometimes the complexity. And we need to speak about, once we speak, it makes them, it's much more organized in their head. But I think now uh, I'm very, we are very lucky in Israel. We have so many schools now that try to work with the new strategies. They understand it's a new world. Uh, I'm very lucky that we have 11 schools now in Israel. You know, it's very tell me, about, tell me about that network. I was going to, I marked down to ask you that before, before we finish. Um, yeah, we have, we, have, we, we, have, we, have, we have elementary schools, boys and girls. And there is now a positive immigration to the Chemish just because people want wow. to educate their kids in, in those schools. And it's not just for Hasidic, it's Lithuanian, everybody. We have different kinds of so elementary school, high school, boys school, a girls school. And uh, we are now very, in, and you know what? Because in the coronavirus, you know, they try to teach their kids via the phone in the Haredi community. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, how you can teach kids, you know, you don't, it's not, you cannot give them visual examples or something like that. And I come up with the idea to open a virtual school for the Haredi community. But it's unbelievable. I start a very special project. The project is Eshkolot. And, and there, so now Haredi can go inside. They have English, math, and physics. Wow. And it's very high pedagogical, pedagogical side. So it's very, very chadash. I mean, it's a very technical and um, a very, very special site. We start with 20, with 20 boys. Now we have 8,000 Haredim wow. on this inside. Yeah. In the general studies. Yeah, yeah, general studies. And, and it's unbelievable because... 8,000. 8,000. Wow. Yeah, yeah, 8,000 8, and five. Because this morning I have, you know, I'm I'm counting Sfirata Omer each day. <laughs> I love I love so much the idea that more and more people, and and what I want to say is that since the Corona, seventy five percent of the Haredi community, maybe it's not official, but the majority of them have now access to the internet, yeah. and and this site is also going inside filters. So now you don't need to publicly say or uh, that you have. Uh, you have access to the secular studies and you can sit at home in your, in your private room and just, uh, and this is a very huge move. And that's why I'm optimistic about those changes. And I, when I'm saying about strategy, I mean, there is new ways 
um, uh, how to, to get more and more people to be able to, to, to integrate the, those, those, those walls. The, 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 the. Sorry, for those that don't know, Rabbi Bambach has been an absolute leader in the, in the Hasidic and, and Haredi community in, in general studies. Um, and, um, you know, again, I had the privilege of seeing this three years ago and, and had, I met with the, the teachers actually, and, and they're so well versed in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in education and teaching. Um, so Rabbi Nachman mentioned that, that, that during Corona, he said, there's not, you know, many people, understandably so many homes were are reluctant to bring in the internet. So when Corona hit, um, they, when Corona hit, um, a lot of the schools were just learning by, on the phone. And Rabbi Nachum, tell me if again, if I'm not doing well, tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah you're fine. And, and Rabbi Nachum was saying that, are you kidding me? How could, they, how could we teach them over a phone if they can't see what we're doing and we can't use visual tools and, and teach in different modalities if we're just talking on the phone? So he created this program for Kodesh and Chol, for, for Hebrew and English. Just for secular studies. For secular studies. He created a program. For, for secular studies that they could learn online during Corona. It started with 20 students. They had 8,000 yesterday and 8,005 today. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, and, and, and so tell me about your vision. You know what, before I do this, I just want to answer one, one, just one thing, because I want to go back to one of the parents um, who asked about that the children don't want to, a child refuses help, a JF underscore, whatever. That. I, I just want to, if a child refuses help, what should you do? Um, my advice to parents when children, uh, the typical refrain, I guess, Rabbi Nachum will find that the same thing in Israel, you probably laugh and nod your head. Um, the, the pa when the parents tell the child you should go for counseling, the children say, go ahead, Rabbi Nachum, you should go. There's <laughs> nothing wrong with me, right? You tell the, they tell the parents, nothing wrong with me. You, you, you're messing up. You're not a good parent. What do you want from me? So I tell parents to go for help first that the parents should tell the children, we love you, our relationship is number one, and if we're not communicating well, and even if, we would love for you to go for help, and when you're ready, let us know. But we're gonna go because we wanna learn how to parent you better. This clearly is not working, and this, we're both partners in this, we're gonna start, and you'll come join us when you're ready. That's what I tell parents to do. You tell the children, we love you, and we wanna make it work, and if you don't wanna go, I stuttered Rabbi Nachum for, as a kid, and my mother, Allah Shalom, um, I was a very restless, you know, school was just a uh, disaster, I couldn't sit still in school. And um, my mother told me that I love you either way, it's okay. If you don't want to fix your stutter, I want you to, but I'd like you to, but you let me know when you're ready to go for therapy. When you're ready to go, I'll drive you, I'll pay for it, but you have to wow. come and tell, what, I'm sorry? Oh, amazing. This was 52 years ago, Amazing. before wow. before all the books came out and stuff. Now I now I understand everything. Yeah, she said. No, that's what she said. She said, "Look, I'll do it, but you have to be ready." So that would be my thing. Uh, so let, let me get back to what I really wanted to talk to. And that, what I really would love to articulate to our listeners is what what's your vision for? You know, you started you started out as a as a rebbe. You went and started a school. You're starting a movement with a, a network of schools. What, what, what do you see, what do you see, your, your big vision, you're, you're, you're an original thinker, you're bold, you're creative, and you're, you're able to make these changes, which I think is so wonderful, organically, that you do it, I, I, did I say, you understand the word, I'm, I'm using an English word, uh, you, uh, organically means that it grows by itself, not inorganic, you know, doing it from the bottom up, um, to be able to create such change and affect such change, um, requires a tremendous amount of tact and leadership, and you're every you're all of there of an Uh Where do you see? I know you're here. You're here to raise money for your projects, um, and um, I, I, I guess, and I, I make the offer again. I never do this, folks. But if anybody's interested in helping Rav Nachum, um, you can contact me. Uh, you can message me here. Uh, at the Bright Beginnings Forum. You can email me at yh at thebrightbeginnings.com. Um, I would love to get you in touch with Rabbi Nachum if you'd like to help us work. But give, give our listeners um, 
the big idea. Like, what do you, what you think big? You've always thought big, Baruch Hashem. So I, I don't know, but by the way, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm at least as curious as everybody else. But what do you see your contribution being? And, and where would you like to take your organization over the next five, 10 years? Uh, so I uh, thank you so much for this great opportunity, Rabbi. I, I also following you for, for many years. I love so much your conversation and your great uh, contribution for Am Israel. Um, uh, I, I want to say something. Uh, I, I'm a Haredi and I'm very, I'm loyal to my community. I'm there because I think there is very great values in my community. And this is why I'm there. And this is why I try to, to, to educate the Haredi, to, to, con to influence the Haredi community. So I want to just say something. Uh, the fact that we are now in Israel, a million and two hundred thousand people, and we are growing, we are doubling ourselves each 25 years. So that means that Israel in the coming years will be in very, very a bad situation. It's, I, I don't want to say tragedy, but the fact that so many people, they are not Torah learning, and they have no any occupation. I mean, they have no any um, uh, discipline. I mean, mikzoa. How do you say uh, mikzoa? The skills. The skills to, to be able yeah, to. Don't I, I just want to. Yeah. Let me give some context, folks. Let me give some context. Israel has eight million people. Um, no, no. Uh, the Haredi Rab community. Rabbi Nachum is talking. That's what I'm saying. I said Israel has eight million people. Rabbi Nachum is, is was saying that that the, the Orthodox community. I don't like the term ultra Orthodox because ultra Orthodox, ultra is over the top, you know, but, that, <laughs> but that's what it's called. So Rabbi yeah. Nachum and I are Haredi, which is another term, which is a term that we like. <laughs> the secular media says ultra Orthodox, but, but um, what Rabbi Nachum is saying that the Orthodox community, the, the ultra Orthodox, the Haredi community um, has 1.2 million people. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and we typically we have a high birth rate and that's expected to double in the next 25 years. And what Rabbi Nachum is, when I, he's articulating his vision, and the big vision is that those, the, the typically in Israel, um, in America, it's perfectly appropriate to go to work right after folks get married or, or, or even some even before or right after the wedding in Israel. Typically, the, the adults are much more likely to stay in Kolo in, in yeshiva learning a very long time. And the, typically the general studies is, is less advanced than it is in America. And Rabbi Nachum is saying that for those, for those who are learning, that's wonderful. The people who are learning and, and Torah yeah. tamum natam, the Torah is, it's an expression, the Torah is their profession. That's yeah. beautiful. But there are so many who aren't really successful in learning and they don't have the skills to go to work and Rabbi Nachum is explaining, please again, if I'm not doing justice, tell me. Rabbi Nachum is explaining, I, 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 want, I want everybody to pick up the nuance here. Rabbi Nachum is saying that the tragedy is that for those who aren't successful in learning, and I'm telling you, I don't know if I'd be able to sit and learn all day. I, I, I like to learn, but you know. Um, so, so I'm saying, Rabbi Nachum is saying the tragedy is that they don't have the opportunity, they don't have the life skills to, to succeed. And as the numbers grow, it's just going to perpetuate. Go ahead, Rabbi Is that how am I doing so far? But okay, that's yeah. So please, so please continue. I think so, it's so important for people to hear. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So, uh, so, so it it could damage not just themselves because they couldn't finance their families, and the poverty is really high. The rate of poverty. It just also damaged Israel. We love Israel. And I think Israel is supposed to continue to be very, all a game, a great country. And people don't contribute with money and, and tax. So that means Israel will be not, in, this is one problem. Another, another problem is I think that the Haredi community, if they will be confident with themselves, they can also live together with the secular and with the, the Tilumi. I think the, the, the previous uh, president of Israel he said about the four tribes. I mean, we can, no one try to change others, but we need to, we have a common, good, a common interest to live together and side by side, because this is the future of Am Israel. 
And when I realized I was, I, I had the privilege for many years ago to open in the pre-academic program in Hebrew University for Haredim, for the ultra Orthodox community. And I, I, get, I, I realized that 50% of them just dropping out from this program because it's really hard to close gap in those ages when you are in the 20. In one year, what people usually learn in 20 years, it's really hard. It's not fair to ask for someone to close those gaps. So that's why I come up with the idea to open um, um, schools that combine secular studies and religious inside the community. I want to... I, I want to make sure, I want to show the community it's possible to stay Haredi and at the same time to be a doctor, engineer, or a lawyer. It's, in America, there is very great examples of, of, uh, of, of Orthodox people, and mainly the modern Orthodox world, that they combine those two worlds. It's normal. That's the way how the sages, uh, the Chazal, uh, uh, act in, in those, in, 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 this is the best example, how, how, how we need to act in our world. So, so I start with one school, the Hasidic is the first high school in the Hasidic community since the Baal Shem Tov. And I start with 14 kids. Uh, I want to tell you something. How many years ago, how many years ago was that, Rabbi Nachum? It's eight years ago. Eight years ago. Yeah, uh, when I, when I, when, before I started school, I asked many, many people, what do you think about? And everybody told me it's not going to work. No one again is going to send their kids to the school. And I said, let's do a great event for 150 people. I will make very nice presentation. I'm going to convince them because I also, I, uh, since I remember myself, I always worked in education. I, I, I manage a school for Russian immigrants. So I came f from this field. Okay. And I worked very hard to make very a nice event and been, so many people said they're going to come. And unfortunately, the night came and just five people came uh, to listen. Okay, and yeah. one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the parents, they said they don't ev have even kids. They just had there's good food here. So they came to... <laughs> <laughs> so that leaves you with four. <laughs> The yes. four parents. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I left before. So I was really frustrating and I, 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 I felt it was my oh, worst yeah. nightmare ever. But I felt in the morning and I said, there is no another way to change those, the, the, uh, to change without education. And that's why I start and the Baruch Hashem, now we have 11 schools, we have 1,400 kids in our schools. Wow. Wow. And we have also the we have also the uh, virtual school, and we are now a network with, with the eight thousand the virtual school with the eight yeah, thousand five. Yeah, eight thousand five. Yeah, eight thousand five. Yeah, I believe it's it's now six because it's going very nice. Your phone, your phone was dinging just now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I believe that we need you know right now in Israel we need to recognize in, in before. Many, for the first four or five years, we, I, we, we said that there is a Lithuanian, Hasidic, and Sephardic community, and each of them have different characteristics. Or, uh, but now we know that 10% of the Haredi community are now modern Haredim. <clears throat> Another 30% were uh, conservative Haredim, but with modern touch. Right. I mean... They very pragmatic. They want to educate the kids in normal schools, right. and we need to uh, to create a reality. It's not about the demand uh, uh, market, yeah. It's about how you create a reality. And I hope if uh, my theory of change is is just if I will get ten percent from the community, I believe it will be a tipping point. There is no way back. And it will make more and more people should feel very confident with this alternative way out to educate the kids. That's my can I can I can I translate, please? Yeah, absolutely. You no, know, because I, I think it's really important. Um, in your message, I really wanted you to. I wanted to hear it myself, but I, I really wanted you to articulate it to our, to our viewers. <clears throat> Just for the backstory. Um, the, in, in, in Israel, the, the, the nature is really part of the backstory. The, the, the folks, the, the, men, the young men who are learning Torah um, are typically, uh, they stay in yeshiva longer and many of them don't, many or most don't serve in the army. 
and it's a source uh, of, unfortunately, of great friction. You can understand parents whose children are, are serving, and you know the Israeli. Uh, um, you know we believe that the, that the Torah protects and that and that the Torah is the most important thing, and, and you know, but not everybody understands it that way. So there's that that level of tension. He, um, Rabbi Nacha mentioned that that uh, Bibi Netanyahu, the previous uh, prime minister, was talking about... No, it, was the pre no, it was the president. Oh, the Rivlin. president. Rabbi Rivlin, uh, Dr. Rivlin, I mean, Rivlin. Yeah, he said that there are four tribes, meaning that, that, that uh, there are these, these different groups, these silos that, that don't interact that much. And what, what Rabbi Nachum was saying, when I asked him for his vision, and again, I, I'm shamelessly going to tell you to, that Investing in this man, I remember I've never done this in my life in public. Um, you know, I'll tell people privately to support someone. I've never done this, um, but I believe in you and I believe in what Thank you're doing, you. and I've seen it. Um, so, investing in this gentleman is investing in the future of, of our nation. So, so what Rabbi Nachman was saying is that that um, the, the 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 multi layered friction sometimes that that becomes um, almost overbearing because you have these issues, let's say, with the army. And, and you know, if you go to most secular Jews and, and you'll say, well, a percentage of the children, um, th they'll tell you right away, look, those who are really learning, call a vote to them, you know, more power to them. But the ones who aren't should come to the army and should come work and get educated. So what, what Rabbi Nassim was saying is that it, it, he, he started, I had the privilege of, Addressing the in the heads of college, the the a, a leadership group. I think were you part of that when I came with the um, Rabbi Shmuel Vigoda, Is that right? Yeah, that was yeah, a number yeah, yeah, of yeah. years ago. So he Rabbi Nachman created um, um, like at the equivalent of like the technical school when when uh, like at the end of for those who are post high school, um, we have it in the general population here also. So this is you, you teach. You plumbing and carpentry and mechanics, you know, so for those who didn't have the opportunity, so Rabbi Nachum started a program for, for adults to be able to learn education, and he was frustrated to see that these well-meaning people who really wanted to study couldn't make up 12 years in, in a year. Rabbi was that what you were expressing? That's what I thought I heard you say, so I want everybody to understand this. So Rabbi Nachum was saying he was so frustrated watching these really good people who, who are willing to take the step, take the plunge, and, and go to university or go to, to improve their, their skill sets, um, were, were themselves frustrated because it's not possible to make up 12 years in, in a year, as, as, as well intended as they are. Imagine it's like starting a race. It's like starting a marathon, you know, an hour after everybody leaves the, leaves the, the front. He didn't say that. Those are my words, but that's the, that, that's the idea. So Rabbi Nachum felt that, that I, again, this is articulating his vision, where he came from and where he sees it going, that even though it was a great program, and it was, um, it was very frustrating. And therefore, he felt that the only way to do it is to start young, to teach the children that they could be Haredi and they could um, be completely uh, committed to our values and, 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 and Torah. And 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 it Hasidish or, or, or Lithuanian style, but Haredi life, and learn secular studies. And if later on they want to go to to to, to learn full time, call it a vote. Great. If they want to, but if they, if they decide to take that path, they should at least be able to and not be handicapped so much. So this movement is spreading. They're up to eleven schools now, and um, Rabbi Nachum feels very strongly that. When it when it hits ten percent of the population, it will become much more uh, um, normalized, and then that things will tip, um, and and then it will become almost a thing that it'll be an option, like it is basically in America, like it is. My, I want I want I want to just tell if I can add something that Rabbi didn't say, that that I I. I just want to explain what I'm hearing Rabbi Nachum say in terms of this vision. And we didn't rehearse this, folks. Um, I, I, I tried, a number of parents came to me in 2008 when, you know, when the economy had that collapse then. Um, and they asked me to make, to, to start uh, uh, controlling the expenses of the bar mitzvot in, in our yeshiva. We had a boys elementary school. We had 190 families. 
270 students. And we were between 30 and 40 bar mitzvahs every year. And the parents came to me and they said, Rabbi Harwitz, please, everybody, you know, we, we can't all do, we can't, just, we can't be the only weirdo that makes a, 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 a small little thing in a basement somewhere in the shul, downstairs in a shul, because nobody else is doing it. They asked me to make it official from the school policy. Um, so what I did was I, um, I, called a, I called a meeting of the parents, fifth, fourth and fifth grade. I said, the sixth graders, you made your plans already. So I told them, I said, I have three choices. I can either not do anything or I could, like a dictator, I could say, this is the rules that, I said, what I'd like to start, I'd like to make it culturally acceptable to do a boba yum in, just for the children, without your friends. Shabbat, you have your friends in shul. This, I want to be able, parents could be able, and if a wealthy fellow wants to make a big splash, because I'm dying, let him do it. And exactly what Rabbi Nachum was saying about tipping, we only had one or two parents a year doing it. And then, so I offered our dining room for free for anybody who wanted to make a bar mitzvah. And within a year, 50% of the parents were already doing it. Wow. 50%. In other words, we made it culturally acceptable. So rather than me come and force them, I said, do it organically, which is the way Rabbi Nachum, and, and when I'm listening to you talk, um, <clears throat> that's really what Rabbi Nachum is saying, rather than come and say, no, this is the way we do it. Everybody has to go to school, and you all need an education. He doesn't do that. He does his own thing. He's working on his own school. But the feeling is that once it, be, it will tip, once more and more families start seeing there's nothing to be concerned about, they could be Haredi and have a, a general studies education and, and, be, and love their country and, and participate in any way they can. Um, somebody wanted to know what the name of the school is. I, I know your, web, your email address changed. The network of schools is Netzach. Netzach, right. But, but the, the Hasidic high school is a Midrasha Hasidit. It's a Madrasha Hasidit, and uh, this year we have 100% matriculation. I mean, the wow. number one place in Israel, uh, <laughs> the first place that 100% has the full Bagrut, 100% of the Atel Medin. The Bagrut, folks, is, is like, um, um, it, it's like a, a diploma, let's say, you know, a high school diploma. Did you have one of the top scores in the country by one of your students, I think I saw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell, one, tell. Of my student, one of my students, I, I, I have someone that he, he came from Williamsburg. He, he didn't even speak Hebrew. From a, Hasidish, father, from a Hasidish family. Yeah, from Williamsburg. He, speak, he was like you at 20. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. And he got the, the number one place in five units in mathematics in Israel. In what mathematics? In? Five units in mathematics. It's the highest score in mathematics. He got the highest math score in the country. Yeah. So one of his, again, one of his students, I remember seeing it, <laughs> one of his students got, got the top grade, uh, uh, Haredi, came from Williamsburg, didn't speak Hebrew even. He, he scored one of the, uh, the top score in the country in mathematics. So that's Rabbi Nachum's vision. I, I, Rabbi Nachum, thank you so much. This is way longer than I expected to stay on. I hope you get some sleep. But I found it fascinating. And um, I think people who listen to the recording um, and, and had the pleasure of watching this, will feel the same way. Um, thank you for, thank you for your leadership. I thank you for, for making it okay for families watching your example to embrace their children. Um, uh, uh, it, it's such a gift that you gave everybody to, to stand there with your daughter, both of you smiling, and letting parents see that this is something that can be done. I hope that that's going to tip also, Rabbi Nachum, that, that the same way your schools will. And, and thank you for what you're creating in your own yeshiva and spreading it to others. Um, I'm always here to help any way I can, Rabbi Nachum. And Hashem should bless you, should bless you with success and um, mazel and bracha. And uh, thank you so much for coming, Rabbi Nachum. Be well. Amen. Good night. Thank you so much. Oh, good morning. Get some sleep, please. Thank you, Rabbi Nachum. Be well. I hope to see thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.